Good afternoon and welcome to Design Master Training. Today we're going to be looking at the panel edit command in Design Master Electrical for Revit. Uh, if you're attending the training live, you can ask questions in the chat box. If you're watching the recording of the training, you can call or email your questions. Our phone number is 866-516-9497 and our email address is support at designmaster.biz. So for today, we are going to be looking at the panel edit command. Uh, this command is the one that sets all the information in your panels and other distribution equipment in Revit uh, that we use then for our calculations. First other thing I want to highlight on this is that for the panel edit command, when you run it, depending on where and how you run it, it will pull up a different default panel so you can use this information to get the, the right panel loaded when you first start the command. So if you're just in a standard Revit model and you run the panel edit command, it will pull up the panel edit window and it's going to load all of the panels in your project over here on the left. If you have a large project, that actually can take a moment because we have to read through and, and pull all those in. Uh, so the, the just loading the panel edit window can be a little slow at times uh, if you are loading all of them. If you select a specific panel in the model and have that as the active item and you run the panel edit command, it will actually load just that one panel for you. So you can speed up the, the initial load of the panel edit by, by selecting something ahead of time and just having that one piece loaded. If you're working in a one line diagram and you run the panel edit command, it will actually just prompt you and say, hey, which device do you want to edit? Because generally, if you're working in here, you're going to be working on a specific uh, panel. You can select that panel, and it will, again, load just that one panel for you. Once you are in the panel edit uh, window, if you need to see the rest of the panels, if you want to go change something else, you can press the load panels button, and it will load all of the other panels in this tree here, so you can go select your other ones. It also disables that button. You can't press it anymore because they've already been loaded. So if you do need to make changes to other ones, press that load panel and it will uh, load them all up for you. The other buttons we've got down here in the corner, the first is to calculate the whole project. Uh, that's gonna do what it says there. It uh, runs all of the Design Master calculations for the entire project. Uh, we don't always run those in the background because if you make a change to a, a wire size and we have to redo the whole voltage drop, that can take a little while. Uh, so we only run that uh, on request. So if you make some changes to a panel and you want to see how that's going to impact your project, you can run the calculate uh, whole project directly from here. That's the same command uh, as the calculate whole project command that is on the uh, ribbon here as well. So we've got the calculate whole project and also we have the calculate part of project. So both of those commands are available from the uh, panel edit window. Calculate part of project will calculate the selected panel and then everything downstream of it. So if we select this MDP2, it'll calculate everything for that panel and everything downstream. It's not gonna go upstream and look at the, anything else in the project but it does do everything downstream of the panel that you have selected. Circuit edit will flip over to the circuit edit command where you can make changes to the branch circuits on your panel. So uh, if you need to get to your, your circuits and make adjustments there, run circuit edit and it'll pull up the panel that you have at active. The final button we have is the highlight panel. This will show you where your panel exists in your model. So if you need to go make a change on it, uh, actually in the model somewhere, you run highlight panel and it'll track it down for you. When I run that command, it actually is gonna give us two prompts because it's in the model and in 3D space. It's also on the one line diagram and you can tell uh, the software which one you wanna see. If we click highlight and model, it will show us, okay, here's that panel. It highlights it for you so you can know which one it is. If you've got a busy model, it might not be clear where it is. So we highlight it. As soon as you click OK, that highlight disappears. So hopefully you remember where it was. And now you have access to that uh, panel and you can make changes, you know, move it around, whatever you need to do. Same thing, if you run panel edit, if you run highlight panel and you select the uh, highlight on single line diagram or whatever, this will list the view on the, the one line diagram view. So if you click that, it will highlight it. 
and it'll show you where it is. Again, it highlights it so that you can see it. As soon as you click OK, it removes that highlight, but the, that's where that device is. So that's just for tracking down your device. If you got a big project, uh, it's helpful for finding those pieces without having to, to manually locate them. Starting from the top, we uh, just have you know, a bunch of attributes here that are used for defining that panel. Uh, this is all the stuff that we've added to Revit in order to do all the calculations that we do. The first one is the device name itself. And this uh, directly corresponds to the name of the device in Revit. So if we select this panel here on the Revit model and we scroll down somewhere, we've got the panel name, MDP2. We also have our panel schedule, which by default is going to be created with the same name as the panel. For whatever reason, in Revit, if you change the panel name through Revit, it doesn't update this panel schedule name at all, uh, which seems like a missed opportunity to us. So if you make that change through our software, it will change it on the model. It'll also go and change that panel schedule sheet for you as well. So uh, that is one thing that we do uh, that's a little different than what Revit does when you change it just through the panel name. We'll actually go update that panel schedule for you as well. Otherwise, it's just the same thing as changing the panel name. Next setting we have is the description in the upstream panel. This is what will show up uh, in the, the panel that it's connected to, what that circuit description is going to be. Uh, if you are using the Design Master circuit descriptions, you can have that turned off where you have Revit control all the circuit descriptions in which case this will be disabled and it'll say, you know, controlled by what Revit's gonna do. But in this case we have it. And so it's gonna, by default, it just uses the panel name. But if you wanted to do something custom, you could say, you know, panel MDP to put some sort of prefix there or something like that. Uh, and then that'll show up in the upstream panel. So that controls that circuit description. These next couple of values, these are all pulling information from Revit and are displaying them for informational purposes. So we tell you what the voltage is on your panel, and we show you the connected and the calculated load uh, from Revit, uh, just so you know what Revit is seeing as the loads on the panel. You can then use that to choose your panel size. So we have the what we call bus size, what Revit calls mains. So we've listed both of those values in Revit. If you go look at the panel, this is the mains parameter on that piece of equipment. Uh, we call it bus size because we felt like that's actually more appropriate description. Uh, and so we have our, our default values here. You can set a custom size. If you've got a custom bus size, you can choose something that's not on our list. We've included kind of the default standard options there. So you can have those as, as you can quickly select or you can type in whatever you want it to be. And this will directly change the mains value in Revit. So it's now a thousand amps. We're going to look at the disconnect next. You'll see that uh, Revit has the MCB rating. We uh, throw that value out and don't use it all, at all. So it's still there. It's kind of like a little appendix in Revit at this point. It exists. We ignore it because they have their mains and their MCB rating completely backwards and how they're implemented. So it wasn't salvageable. So we throw theirs away and we use our own. Uh, so in Revit, you can set the disconnect type either as main lugs only a breaker or a fused switch. If you choose a breaker or a fused switch, you can then specify the size of the trip in the frame. Defaults to the bus size, generally that's what you're going to be, but you can also you know, put in a smaller breaker there as appropriate. So if we wanted to put in an 800 amp breaker, we could do that. So you got 1000 amp panel, 800 amp breaker, and that's how you specify that. We have the select breaker curve button. And this will give you an option to select the specific breaker that is associated with that main disconnect. We use this then for the uh, arc flash for finding trip times and also for our selective coordination graphs. So this is where you can come in and say, I've got this specific manufacturer. This is the breaker I'm using. These are all the settings uh, that I'm using for that breaker. Obviously, you only need to go in here and set this if you're doing selective coordination or you're doing arc flash. Otherwise, you can ignore it because none of these settings really matter beyond those two uh, specific applications. So all the other calculations, fault, voltage drop, all that stuff, uh, they don't depend on the specific breaker in the way that those calculations do. 
These last three, uh, again, are pointing just to Revit parameters. So it's showing you what, what you could set in properties uh, in Revit for this panel. The mounting in the enclosure, those are standard Revit uh, parameters. We just display them here so you can update them without having to exit out and go into the Revit parameter section. For lugs, we are pulling the settings that you've uh, specified in Revit and, and interpreting that for what it is. So if you don't set the feed through lugs, we're just going to call it the standard lugs. Uh, however, in Revit, we can go in here and actually set a feed through lug. So if I select this MDP2 over here, we have feed through lugs. If I check that, so it's turned on, when we go into panel edit, it's now going to say, okay, this is, has feed through lugs. So we see that this actually has feed through lugs and that shows up uh, in the schedule in Revit. And then you can also, if it has feed through lugs, specify it as subfeed lugs, um, and that ends up being top lugs versus bottom lugs. Uh, and so we that'll be double lugs for up at the top. So the connection is a top lugs connection there. So we're pulling that from the, the settings that you specify in Revit, and you do need to set that in Revit. Um, so that's it's disabled here. You have to go in and change that in properties and get that right in Revit, uh, and then that in Revit will, will flow through to your panel schedule as well to get the loads right. So we're just using the, the values they've got there. Next, we have the schedule display options. These are yes and no for whether it's being shown in the feeder, voltage drop, and fault schedule. What these are doing is they are controlling a parameter in Revit that we then use for filtering. So if I go to schedules, if I go to my voltage drop schedule, we have uh, a filter in here. This is a standard Revit schedule. There's nothing special about this schedule other than we've built it to look nice with the values that you would want for voltage drop. Uh, and we include in it by default a filter based upon this uh, voltage drop display value. It's a yes, no uh, value. If it's set to no, then we filter it out. And so the way you can change what that parameter is going to be is in the panel edit. If you make the change here for the, the show and feeder schedule, yes and no. The one line diagram section, this is controlling the graphics that we use on the one line diagram. Uh, it controls the downstream and the upstream overcurrent protection graphics and then the feeder ID graphic. Uh, so I'm gonna zoom out so we can see all of those graphics and then we'll make some changes to them. So uh, MDP2 is a good example because we've got downstream uh, circuits, and then we've got the, the upstream feeder. So if I run panel edit, and I change the downstream overcurrent protection graphic, we'll use a fused switch. What that's gonna do is it's gonna change all of the devices connected to it, and instead of using a breaker graphic, it's gonna use a fused switch graphic. There's nothing really in terms of the electrical model that's changing there. This is simply a graphic on the single line diagram that's being changed. So there, there's nothing in terms of calculations that's different. It's just going to be a different graphic here. Uh, and then the other setting we have is the upstream over current protection graphic. I'll change that to a non-fused switch. And that will change the graphic up here for the, over, for the feeder. Uh, you do end up with a case where this, for MDP2, the, this uh, switch here is the downstream circuit overcurrent protection. It's also obviously the upstream overcurrent protection for uh, this panel. So there's kind of a hierarchy of, of defaults. The first place we look is the device itself. If it has an upstream value, then we use what the, the setting is there. If it doesn't, we look at the upstream device and look at what its circuit values are. If it has a value, we use that. And if it doesn't have a value there, we go to project options and we use the default there. So we can come in here and we can make a change to LP2B. If we up change the upstream overcurrent protection graphic, the default setting is to use whatever it's set in the upstream uh, panel. But if we change the value here, set it back to a circuit breaker, it's going to use this. It's going to look to this first and say, okay, I'm going to use the circuit breaker. And it will do that. And the other ones are set to use what the MDP2 is set to. So that's how we're, we're controlling those. In the one line commands, if you run the add modify graphic command, 
and you actually change this graphic here, it's going to change that setting as well. So we keep those setting, settings synchronized. So if we replace that overcurrent protection graphic, we're going to change it back to a breaker. It'll put that graphic in. And then we look at the panel and it updated that value for us. So running the add modify graphics will update what this is going to show you. Uh, and then the feeder ID graphic works the same way. By default, there's a, a default feeder uh, ID graphic being used. It's a hexagon. If I change it to an oval for this one feeder, it'll change it from a hexagon to an oval. So if you need to change that graphic, you can. Next section is the upstream connection. This is really just setting the overcurrent protection trip size uh, and the corresponding frame size. The default setting is it's going to look at the main disconnect and match that size. So we're having, by default, we'll have an 800 amp uh, overcurrent protection. If the main disconnect is set to match the bus, then we'll just match the bus at that point. If you're connected to a transformer, we assume that you don't have overcurrent protection, so we'll leave it off uh, and just have lugs there. You can also change it so that uh, if it's connected to a transformer and you want a breaker, you can have, there's a setting where you'll get a breaker for a transformer. You can also set it for whatever you want to always be lugs. So if we change this to lugs here, uh, you, you, we're not gonna have an overcurrent protection. And then we also can specify a specific breaker size if you want to. And in the same way we had the select breaker for the breaker curve for the disconnect, we also can select the breaker curve for our overcurrent protection. So the breaker in the upstream panel, this is where you would set that curve. The next section after that is the feeders. So this uh, is going to display what the feeder is to this panel and give you the option to change the values on it. We'll tell you where we're being fed from, what the current uh, call out is for that feeder, so all the sizes, and then we list the voltage drop, both the voltage drop from just the upstream panel and then the total voltage drop coming from the utility. And we can change our conductor size and everything else down here. So we've got the conductor. We're by default using our default settings, but we can adjust that. We could use a different sizing method. So right now we're sizing it basically using our copper. I could select the aluminum and now it will size it automatically for us, but using our aluminum sizing options instead. So it's going to give us aluminum wire. But if I come here and I adjust this breaker size, it's still going to use that aluminum wire but that new breaker size. And you can also give it a specific uh, wire size as well if you want to. So you can come in and choose just, this is what I want it to be. This is generally for upsizing purposes. We've got a 400 amp uh, feeder, but we might need to upsize for voltage drop purposes. So we could go to uh, 450 and then we'll use that as the wire size and it'll uh, adjust these voltage drop values. It'll adjust at least the voltage drop from the upstream and it'll recalculate just that little section from the utility. You can then also change your neutral size. So by default, it's gonna match the conductor size. You can choose a specific size wire. You can also do a double phase. And when you do this, it's gonna put in two neutral wires essentially. And uh, it will then derate that wire based upon the ampacity and uh, because you, uh, if you have on a three phase circuit, you would at this point have five current carrying conductors. And so we'll do the derating uh, based upon that. So our wire size got a little bit bigger there. You can also just choose a specific size neutral if you need one for whatever purpose. Same with the ground. By default, we're sizing the ground and the ground actually has a couple layers of sophistication in that sizing. Uh, it depends first on what it's connected to. If it's connected to um, a transformer or it's not connected to anything, basically the, the utility, we're going to use a service ground, which is the NEC 250.102. Uh, so that's for transformers and really connected to, no to nothing. If it's connected to a regular panel, it's going to use an equipment ground 251.22. So if you leave it to size automatically, we're choosing that based upon what you're connected to. You can always override it and say, okay, I want this one to use an equipment or a service ground as appropriate. And then you can set to no ground uh, if you're using, say, the, the um, conduit and you're assuming that's the ground, or you can give it a specific ground size. 
Uh, it also, when you're sizing automatically, either with this first option or any of the, either of the second two, when you upsize your conductor, um, actually this is really only if it's uh, an equipment ground, the NEC says that if you upsize your conductor, you need to upsize the ground proportionally. So we will upsize the ground at the same time. So we don't, so we'll do the, the sizing of the ground there for you as well. You can add an IG conductor if you need that as well. And then you can also specify your specific conduit size. We'll default to sizing the conduit to have a 40% fill based upon the wires you've chosen, uh, but you can adjust that and choose a different size wire, uh, a different size conduit. So if you choose something small, it will let you. The software does let you be the engineer and choose whatever you want. It's going to point out your conduit fill is over 100%. Those wires are not going to fit in that, but you can specify it. Uh, you can also choose something bigger, and it'll show you what that conduit fill is again. There's a question, will the single line diagram update uh, as you make these changes to the equipment? And the answer is yes. So as we're making all of these changes, the single line diagram is going to pick all of these up and uh, update to match. So if I exit out at this point, we've been messing around with this MDP2. You're going to see that it's now, uh, so it's still that 1,000 amp panel. It now has a 400 amp disconnect rather than the 800 that we were working with. And it's got that 450 amp feeder specified as well. So all of those values are, are being updated and pushed into the single line diagram automatically. The other option for conductor size is custom. Uh, so up here you can choose custom. This allows you to type in any text that you want for your uh, conductor size. And then you can specify your uh, custom, excuse me, impedance values, your X and your R values. So this, uh, the, the common example would be for a bus duct or a bus gutter. You don't actually have a feeder, you've got a, a bus duct. So you can say the feeder, the call out's just gonna be the bus duct. Then you go to the manufacturer's cut sheet, you figure out what the impedance values are. They usually need something smaller, but you'll need to figure that out. Uh, our values are in ohms per 1,000 feet. That's what the NEC Table 9 units are. Your uh, manufacturers typically have a slightly different, they may be using ohms per 100 feet or maybe ohms per 10,000. So you do need to do a little bit of conversion to make sure that you're in ohms per 1,000 feet. Uh, and then you can make your adjustment there. So set the X and the R value, and those are obviously important for all of our voltage drop and uh, fault calculations. So if it was something like that, you can make your adjustments and then you've got your new uh, custom conductor. So this is useful, again, for something like that. Or if you have a one-off scenario, maybe you've got an existing feeder that's got some weird sizes and you don't want to go into wire amp capacities and, and get that into the software, you can just type it in and give it whatever you want. Uh, this is also how you would do it if you wanted to put uh, multiple feeder parallel runs in a single conductor. We don't have a way to do that in the software uh, by default but you could uh, figure out that wire size string, put that in here, uh, figure out the uh, corresponding X and the R values. I'll put those in here as well. Um, so that would be the way to handle that. We also have the ambient temperature. We'll use that for derating. By default, it's 30 degrees. Uh, so that's the temperature we're using for, our, uh, for the sizing. If you increase that temperature, we'll derate the wire. So we're gonna go from 600 KC mil and it's going to give us two runs of four out at this point. So it upsized that wire and basically gave us two parallel runs instead. So the NEC um, has gone through a number of different revisions on how to treat the temperature over a roof. They used to have some adjustments based upon uh, how far it was from the roof and whatnot. They later have decided, well, maybe that didn't matter so much so that uh, they don't have those same adjustments anymore. So we were going to put those in, but they kept changing how it was. So you'll need to look at the current NEC for your area to figure out if you have any sort of roof adjustments or anything else. Uh, and this is where you can then come in and, and just manually type in what the corresponding ambient temperature is. Then we have the length values for the feeder. By default, uh, we have in the project, you'll have a setting for what the default length is based upon right angles versus uh, straight line. This project is set to use right angles. It's basically doing an X and a Y calculation. And then we do an elevation difference, a Z. We can also do a straight line where it'll go kind of as the crow flies. Uh, and we'll still have the elevation difference between the two panels. 
Now, so those are the two uh, main calculation methods. We also can do the Revit calculated length where we ask Revit what the length of this feeder is. If you just use that length uh, without doing anything else, Revit actually gives you a value between right angles and straight line. I'm not really sure where it gets that value. We don't really document it, but that's what Revit will give you. Revit also has the circuit path feature. If you're using the circuit path, uh, it will then stick that into the length of that feeder, and so we can pull that value out. So if you're tracing the circuit path in Revit, you can use Revit calculated length and get that into Design Master for using in your calculations. And finally, we have the fixed value. This is where you can come in and type in whatever you want and the software will just use that value. So if you don't want to trace it out, if the numbers we're calculating aren't what they need to be, you can just tell us what that value is. If you're using one of the calculation methods, we also have the wire makeup. This is uh, an additional length of wire added to it uh, to account for making the connection to the feeder. Uh, if you had something that uh, where you were going up to the ceiling and back down, you could put the, that additional length in here as well because if you're going between two panels at the same elevation, but you, again, you have to go up to the ceiling, say you're in a warehouse, you go up 40 feet to the ceiling and then down 40 feet, that's a significant length, but we're not gonna see that because if the two panels are both on the, the wall at the floor, they look like they're at the same elevation. Uh, so you could come in here, you have a default wire makeup, but you could also put in a, a custom value as well. So if you need extra length there, you can type it in, and this will be added to whatever the calculated length is. This wire makeup is only used when doing calculated values. If you set it to a fixed value, we're not going to then also add the wire makeup. At that point, we're like, uh, we, we ignore that. If you need wire makeup in your fixed value, you just add it yourself to that fixed value. So when you're using fix, just tell us exactly what it is, and we're not going to make any more adjustments on it for you. If you uh, choose right angles, so the building by default has a kind of a building angle. If you specify right angles for a, a panel, it will give you an option to adjust the building angle. And this is what that X and the Y angles are. So if you've got a, a wing of the building that's rotated 30 degrees relative to the rest of the building, you could type that in here. And so it'll, it'll rotate the X and the Y axes that it's doing that calculation on. So rather than, you know, being X and Y up and down, it would be, you know, X at some angle and then the Y at an angle as well. After the feeder, we have the circuit length section. These are the length sections that are used for everything connected to this panel. So downstream feeders and branch circuits, we actually have them separated out differently. So if you wanna have your seed feeder and your branch circuit lengths calculated uh, differently, you can. And we can set them. So if you have one panel where you want all of the lengths calculated using a straight line, you could come to that panel and make the change here and say, okay, for this panel, everything connected is going to do a straight line calculation. Uh, and that way you don't have to change everything downstream of it, you just change it here and then everything downstream will kind of default to this as the value. Uh, and again, the branch circuit wire makeup, uh, you can specify uh, if there's makeup for the branch circuit wires and if, there's, if that wire makeup is for each device on a branch circuit or for just one. Because if you've got like 10 receptacles, do you wanna add that wire makeup for each receptacle or just one receptacle, depending on your situation, you might do it differently. So you've got the option to, to use it wire makeup per device or per circuit. And then below that, we have the fault calculations. We list the total fault at the device, including the motors. So anything that's marked as a motor will include in the fault calcs, and that'll be displayed here. You can also set the utility uh, fault. Uh, right now it's calculated. Typically, you will get a utility fault from the utility, and you can specify that, and then we use that as the basis of our calculation. So if I go up to our service transformer, I can set a fixed utility fault, and that'll then be used in our calculation. There are different settings for transformers from panels. We'll look at those once we've gone through the panels uh, to see how the transformers are a little different. So I'm going back to a panel now. Uh, and if you do specify your utility fault, uh, you can specify the XR ratio as well. It'll give you a default value, but you can give it uh, another one if you want it to be. And then we have the AIC rating. This links to what Revit calls the short circuit rating, I believe. The short circuit rating. 
uh, we call it AIC rating, same idea. And if you put the value in there, uh, it'll just fill in that parameter in Revit for you. We don't automatically choose this value, and that's actually, from the beginning of the software, been an intentional decision. Uh, AIC rating uh, really has a huge impact on the cost of your panel, uh, and so we want you as the engineer to be specifically choosing those and thinking about them and making sure that you're choosing the right one. Because in addition to cost, there's also fire safety involved. And so the engineer uh, needs to be the one to come in here and make the right choice. So we'll calculate the fault and then you manually set the AIC rating for that uh, panel. And our nearly last section is the arc flash calculations. If you are called on to do arc flash, there's an additional information you need to provide. Kind of the starting point is your fault. So we calculate that uh, and that you're doing pretty much in all of your projects. Uh, the arc flash takes that and layers on a couple more pieces for the arc flash calculation. Uh, in particular, you need to know the electrode configuration. Um, for all of the arc flash uh, values, we have an unknown setting, which basically means I, I don't know but I need to do this, so give me the worst case scenario. So if you say unknown, we're gonna say, okay, you don't know, so we're gonna give you the worst case scenario for this, uh, because if you know and it's better, then, then you're, you're still safe in terms of arc flash. For the electrode configuration, we have uh, this knowledge base article on our website that shows you graphically what those arc uh, electrode configurations look like. There's the vertical conductors inside the metal box. So you've got your conductors in orange, so they're vertical. And then you've got a box around it that's kind of a standard panel being fed from the top or bottom. There's vertical conductors with an insulating barrier uh, that they're terminated in. So that's what this one looks like where they, they're actually terminated somewhere. You've got also the horizontal conductors. So if the conductors are coming straight out toward you, again, in a box, it's gonna look like this. And then there's also a uh, options if the conductors are out in the open air. So if you don't have a panel enclosure, if they're in the open air, uh, that those are the options that you would use. So generally speaking, you know, most of our panels are, are going to be in some sort of enclosure, probably vertical conductors, but the configuration does matter. And we notate here what changing this does. Vertical conductor uh, gives you slightly lower values. If actually, if you have the insulating barrier, it gives you higher values. And the horizontal gives you the highest of, the, of any of them. So for the electrode configuration, if you don't know, we are going to call it horizontal conductors, actually horizontal conductors or electrodes inside the metal box. Yeah, so it, it gives you horizontal conductors because that's the, the worst case. But if you know better, you can choose one of the other options. If you choose your configuration, if it has an enclosure, you can then specify that enclosure size because that's gonna, again, impact the arc flash. If you don't know, it defaults to a 20 by 20 by nine box, which again, is gonna give you your worst case uh, scenario. So anything smaller or larger than that ends up with a lower arc flash. If it's smaller, uh, I believe it contains it, so it just, it can't uh, expand, it doesn't, reflect as much. If it's bigger, you're starting to get into basically an open air configuration. So it's kind of going to the open air uh, end point there for the calculation. You can specify the gap between the conductors. Again, if you don't know, we'll give you a default value. If you do know, you can specify what that gap is in inches. You can specify the working distance. By default, you kind of assume an 18 inches. But if you're gonna use that 18 inches, you do actually have to come here and select known. If you don't, if you say, oh, I'm just not even gonna think about what the working distance is, we're gonna give you 12. Basically, okay, we're gonna give you something a little bit more conservative even than what a default value would be. That we're gonna say 12 inches, you're, you're up in your face in there. Uh, so if you know that, oh, it's not actually 12, it's, you know, the 18 is, is okay. You have to manually set that. Uh, using all those values, you run them through the calculation and you get your arcing current. So we'll list those two values here. There's a maximum and a reduced value. And then uh, there's an arcing time. This is again where these breaker curves that we set before, you use that arcing current to figure out your arcing time, how long it uh, takes to trip that breaker. Uh, so you can uh, automatically calculate it. 
and we'll figure it out based upon the curve. If there's no curve, we'll use two as your default maximum value. The assumption being that the person will escape after two seconds. Uh, but you can manually set it also. So if, we, if, if you don't have a breaker curve, we have breaker curves built in, but we don't have all of the breaker curves that exist in the world yet. So if you really need to get something done, you can go look up the breaker curve manually, figure out what your arcing time is, and manually type those values in. Uh, or if it sets a no, it'll de calculate by the, the default value, and then it'll display the incident energy uh, that's being calculated and the uh, arc flash boundary distance. And those are the final, kind of out final output values for the arc flash calculation. The very final thing uh, that we've tucked down here is a one AutoCAD setting, which is whether you should show this device on the one line diagram in AutoCAD. So we have the one line diagram in AutoCAD back from uh, our 1.4 release. We're still maintaining it for people who use it and like it. We're kind of trying to move away from it and get the single line diagram into Revit like we've been showing. But uh, for the customers who are still using AutoCAD, this is an option for whether this device should be shown in AutoCAD or not. So it's tucked down here, hidden away. Uh, at some point, we will eventually get rid of the AutoCAD single line diagram, and then that setting will also disappear. Let's go take a look at a transformer, because it has a couple different settings from a panel. Generally, most of it's the same. Uh, up here in the top section, for the voltage, instead of uh, just the voltage, we do list the primary and the secondary voltage. So you can see uh, both values there. You can specify the transformer size uh, in KVA. We have default sizes built in. You can specify a custom size. For whatever reason, Revit doesn't have an intrinsic transformer size, so we have to specify it separately from what Revit does because they don't have anywhere to even put that value. And then you can specify the K-factor rating uh, I believe we put this into a shared parameter. Uh, so this shows up as a shared parameter. It's not really used otherwise in our software, but you can specify it. Uh, and then scrolling down, the other place where we have a difference is in the fault calculations. So in addition to the utility fault uh, and AIC rating and fault with your motors, there's also the transformer impedance and the transformer XR ratio. So you can specify these values as well. So we uh, have kind of built-in transformer impedances based upon the transformer size, but you can override these and specify what you want to use if you actually know what the impedance is of your transformer. Same with the XR ratio. We default to five. You can override that if you have a better value from the manufacturer. So that is it for what we can do in the panel edit command. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. While you think of those questions, I'm going to go ahead and show you how to put these labels on the single line diagram. So if we come over here to the single line diagram and we click on this panel again over here on the left, we have a bunch of shared parameters that we can use to annotate it. Uh, and it's a matter now of getting a, a label in there that has that information. So if I run insert, I'm going to load my annotation family. Uh, here is my customization folder. So uh, in Design Master, you have a customization folder by default. It's actually going to be, if you do percent app data percent like that, this will take you to your application data folder where we put all of our information. And then under Design Master Software and Electrical RT, I believe there's typically a customization folder. This computer is not set up. Uh, how yours would be, but there's a customization folder there where you could uh, find all of our default values. Uh, and you're going to have all of these options in here. I'm going to go down to my tags. So we have a bunch of tag families. These have additional information. Uh, I'm going to grab this one. This has the fault value, and we're going to load just that one in here. Now I can select this panel, tag by category, and put a new tag on here and it happens to use the last tag that we loaded. Uh, we can select that tag and that's gonna use that new value. So that's the fault value uh, on that panel. So it's using that new tag I loaded. That tag happens to be loading that parameter value. And then you can adjust the leader and put the tag wherever you want. We have default tags, which have a, a number of default values, which you can use. You can also create your own tags with your own shared, with our shared parameters in them. 
So if I select this tag, I can run edit family. And we can see how this thing is constructed. Right now, the label is the one parameter that we've got there. It's got the fault at the device. If you want to show a different value, you need to load that in here. And actually the first step in doing that is you need to go to manage and you need to go to shared parameters and you need to choose your shared parameter file. By default, we ship these with Design Master. They're in your program files, Design Master uh, software electrical RT folder. So you can go pull our shared parameters from there. So you come here, you change it to our shared parameter file temporarily. You modify your label, you add a parameter. You can add a shared parameter. If you do select, it'll pull the ones from the shared parameter file that is currently active. So if we, for example, wanted to do an arc flash value, we can do that here. We'll do the incident energy at the uh, maximum current. Click OK, and then we can add this here. Let me get rid of that fault. So this is, we're gonna make a new label out of this one. Uh, there's a question, can we add an append, uh, append text to the tag? And the answer to that is yes, you have a prefix and a suffix that's built into Revit that you can add as additional information. For things like unit labels, there's a couple ways you can handle that. Uh, our text by default sometimes includes that value, sometimes doesn't. If So we have the DMET values, those are gonna be text. We also have the DMEN, which are numeric. Those are gonna have a unit associated with it. And so Revit will actually add the, that prefix and suffix for you. Uh, so sometimes it'll show up and if it doesn't, this is where you would make that change. So we'll have a prefix on here. I'm gonna uh, save this as a new family. We can load this into the project and then we can tag this here. And what you'll see uh, in this case is it's actually giving us a question mark. What that means is that this family doesn't have that shared parameter in it. So it's gonna give you a question mark in that case. Our default single line diagrams don't have all of the shared parameters that you could ever possibly include on them by default. So you would need to actually add that shared parameter to the single line family as well. So I'll edit this family and we need to add it as a uh, parameter to the family type here. So this is where we've got all of our values are listed here. These are the ones that we kind of included by default. So I will add a new one. It's gonna be a shared parameter. And it's our incident energy. Now it's loaded in there, click okay. Load this into project. Assuming I got everything right, it'll show up. Because I had it set as a type. So it needs to be an instance parameter. I think that's probably gonna be what my dip uh, problem was. I'll load that into the project again. There we go. So now it's being loaded up. So now when we run our calculate, it will populate with the right value. When you do this, you do have to obviously be careful, make sure you're getting everything set up right so that uh, all the values are working right. And that's you know as much a Revit challenge as a design master challenge at that point. Thank you for watching today's Design Master training. Contact us with questions or comments by calling 866-516-9497 or emailing support at designmaster.biz.